Welcome to Mayflower Congregational United Church of Christ, where we believe that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and then 11 through 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered it. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen. For all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Here ends this reading, inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Here we are again, same scene, second verse, or maybe fifth verse, it's hard to keep track. I'm sure you recognized the setting. The Pharisees and scribes are mad at Jesus. Again, pitchforks at the ready. Jesus has befriended about seven too many tax collectors and sinners. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them, they complained. It turns out that Jesus has a real problem with purity. Imagine the trouble he would get into with the Oklahoma State Legislature. <laughs> Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus is hosting dinner parties with people who don't deserve it. This is the problem. Said, so of course, Jesus has something to say about the scribes and Pharisees' disapproval. He has three parables. The parable of the lost coin, 
the lost sheep, and the lost boy. All three parables tell us that God is too busy rejoicing over found sheep, found coins, and found children to be worried, mad, or vengeful. They are arguably the the best known parables of all the Gospels. This morning we read only the third parable, the the verses we skipped, verses 4 through 10, those had the parables of the lost sheep and coin. But this is the third parable, the one commonly known as the prodigal son. By definition, prodigal means spending money and resources freely and recklessly. Who knows when people started calling it the parable of the prodigal son, probably early on. Because of how the parable ends, it is best for us to see ourselves as the prodigal son, the one who has spent money and resources recklessly, even if it means saying that we've squandered our inheritance and can only be trusted to work with pigs. Even if that's what we have to admit, it's okay, because the prodigal son gets the fatted calf. The prodigal son gets the fancy robe and the new shoes. The prodigal son gets the party. And besides, it really is pretty natural to identify with the prodigal son. We've got big dreams, baby. We're on our way. All we need is a little seed money, or as my grandma would say, a little folding money. We're going to get out of this one-horse town. We're off to bigger and better things. We've got big plans. And then something distracts us. A squirrel. (laughs) I'm sure the prodigal son didn't intend to wind up in the pig trough. We never do. A shortcut here, a detour there. We do something we think no one will notice, and then another something, and then another something, a lie here, a cover up there, we begin to lie to ourselves, even when the alarm bells are sounding and the red flags are waving, we work hard to convince ourselves that everything will turn out okay, even when friends and family try to warn us, well, that's when we head to a foreign land, which may not be all that far away, but we're definitely out of touch, out of reach. We may not even notice when the downward spiral begins. Since we've separated ourselves from the people who love us, the ones who will tell us the truth, we usually just keep heading in the wrong direction. And who knows why? The parable lets us pretend that rock bottom means literal poverty and literal hunger. But we all know wealthy, poor people, poor in heart, poor in spirit, poor in friendship. And we know plenty of well-fed people who are starving to death from loneliness or self-obsession. These conditions are like being far from home and dying from lack of what the body and soul need to live. If we're lucky, at some point we come to and notice where we are. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. It may not even be that we're sorry. The prodigal son doesn't seem to be sorry, at least not sorry for the trouble he's caused and the inheritance he's wasted. He seems most sorry that he's hungry and hasn't had a shower. He seems sorry that there are people, those hired hands, who thinks he thinks deserve less of life. Those hired hands, they have enough food, enough to spare. Why shouldn't he? He's the son of a man of means. So he comes up with a very good apology, a very, very good apology. This is the work of a seasoned younger sibling. (laughs) Those younger siblings know how to work, parents. Hardly 
Ever do we find an eldest child who has tattoos and piercings. Not allowed, not my kid. But then along comes number two, and they somehow manage to get the parent to drive them to the tattoo parlor and sign the consent forms. All of the eldest siblings in the room know what I'm talking about, but back to the parable. The prodigal son isn't sorry, and we aren't always either. We can usually come up with perfectly good explanations for what has happened to us. Bad luck, no luck, or it's somebody else's fault. So we head back home, carefully curating our words, rehearsing the lines on the way, and hoping the right person comes out to greet us. This is what happens for the prodigal son. The father is actually looking for him to appear on the horizon. But while he was still far off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father interrupts him before he can get to the part where the son asks to be treated like one of the hired hands. Let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. That's it. The reason that we love this parable. This is better than the best case scenario, because it is so unexpected and what we're all hoping for. There seem to be no consequences. Forgiveness with no strings attached. We don't even have to completely apologize. Oh yes, this is a wonderful parable. We love this parable, an excellent parable, Jesus. The problem though, is that the parable doesn't end where it should. The parable should end right there at the end of verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate, period. He has returned home and the dinner and dancing has begun. So the end. But no, there are seven more verses. The problem with these seven verses is that they remind us that we are not just the prodigal son in the story. We are also the other brother. We, we would like to deny it, but it is the truth. If we can be one brother, we can also certainly be the other brother. And the truth is, we usually resonate more strongly with the older brother, the one who plays by the rules the one who has kept her head down, finished school, got a job, and pays the bills, the one who takes care of what needs tending, the one who visits the grandparents, mows mom and dad's lawn, and volunteers at the food pantry. When the prodigal brother comes limping up the drive, we just stand there, and our stomach begins to ache. When dad runs down to greet him, arms flung wide, tripping over himself to get to the wayward brother, yelling something about new clothes and a hot meal, all we can think is, nope, nopity, nope, nope. This is wrong. What kind of parable is this? Is the younger brother just going to get away with it? What about reap what you sow? What about chickens coming home to roost? What about consequences? Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him, Oh yes, older brother, we feel you. We feel your rage and contempt. We feel your frustration. We are standing right there with you, mad as a hornet in a Coke can, sulking at the back door, arms crossed, shaking our heads at this upside down chain of events. No good deed goes unpunished. 
and we're keeping score. Dad is giving away the farm to this irresponsible, no-good hack who probably doesn't brush his teeth regularly. Instead of the prodigal son, this parable should be called the prodigal father. He, too, is spending money and resources freely and recklessly. Of course, the prodigal father also fits the other definition of prodigal, and it is this, having or giving something on a lavish scale. And this is exactly how to describe the prodigal father, wastefully extravagant, wastefully extravagant with love and forgiveness and welcome. You know why this parable isn't known as the prodigal father? Because we don't want to play that part. We are too busy being the older brother and boy, does righteous indignation feel like a warm coat on a cold winter's day. What the father needs to do is let the prodigal son earn it back. He can start out working with the pigs, since he was willing to do that before when he was hungry. If he proves responsible, maybe he can tend to the chickens or the horses He'll need to live out back for a while. Maybe sleeping under the stars will give him a fresh perspective. We might invite him in for family celebrations, you know, grandma's birthday or mother's day, but not anything for him, not anything for him. A party for him is out of the question, especially now. How can the father not see this? How will this irresponsible, flaky young brother learn anything at all if all he gets when he finally comes home is a party? How will anyone, when they've made terrible decisions, wasted everything, and think only of home when they are hungry, learn anything? What lesson will they learn? The preacher Fred Craddock says that the only thing they will learn is this. We love you. You are forgiven. Welcome home. That's it. We love you. You are forgiven. Welcome home. This is the worst parable. The worst parable ever. We can't say those words, we love you, you are forgiven, welcome home. Only God can say things like that. They are too big for us. And what about those times when we shouldn't let people back into the house? Are we supposed to just give abuse or violence a copy of the house key? No. Love and forgiveness is about the state of our own hearts. Welcome is a posture, not a doormat. It is a way of approaching the world. We love you, you are forgiven, welcome home means many, many different things. But we actually have to say it and mean it. Otherwise, we're stuck outside the party, sulking, bitter, worrying about our own fortune, minimizing our love and care of others to do something for others because we'll get a reward, not because it's right and good. Otherwise, we reduce forgiveness and welcome to a zero-sum game instead of the embodiment of God. And we are all made in the image of God. It won't be easy. We already know that. But perhaps we just need to practice. We love you. You are forgiven. Welcome home. Come on, say say it with me. We love you. You are forgiven. Welcome home. One more time. We love you. You are forgiven. Welcome home. Amen.